Okay, uh, so thank you everyone for being here uh, to listen to my talk. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, using a stepwise Bayesian approach to infer divergence times. So as we just saw in the very interesting talk that Tracy gave, um, as phylogeneticists, we're often not only interested in inferring the tree topologies of the organisms of interest that we have, we also are interested in when these branching events actually happen in time. And this allows us to um, more, um, you know, perform analyses to understand macroevolutionary patterns and processes, do things like look at rate variation across lineages through time, or uh, correlate, say, evolutionary events with geological events. And so generally the way that we do these analyses when we infer divergence times in a Bayesian context is we use what is called, uh, what, what we call this the joint approach. So you have as input data, you have your genetic sequence data generally, and then you have in your hierarchical Bayesian model all the parameters that are relevant here. So that includes your tree topology, your divergence times, it includes uh, your genetic sequence uh, model, evolution model parameters, and includes your clock model parameters and everything. And we basically infer the values of all these parameters at once, right? So we have this very complex multi-dimensional integral because we have all these parameters. Uh, which we can't solve analytically, so we have to use numerical sampling methods such as MCMC. And then at the very end, you get out what you're actually interested in, which is this posterior distribution of uh, ultrametric divergence time trees. So what I'm going to be talking about today is um, what we call the stepwise approach. And what we're basically doing here is we're taking these hierarchical Bayesian models and we're breaking them up into multiple steps. So I'm not going to go into the math in the interest of time, but we do have a preprint on BioArchive. Uh, I'll have the link at the end. Uh, so if you're interested in how this is actually derived mathematically, you can go to that preprint and look. But the general idea is, um, specifically in the context of divergence time estimation, what we're doing is we're breaking this joint approach up into two steps. And in our first step, we have as input our genetic sequence data. And then we use the sequence data to infer a posterior distribution of unrooted branch length trees, you know, just sort of a standard phylogenetic analysis. And then in our second step, we do what's called important sampling. And what this basically is, is we take this posterior of unrooted branch length trees and we uh, take a subsample from that posterior. And then we use these subsampled trees as our input data in step two during which we actually infer uh, our posterior of ultrametric um, divergence time trees. So the reasons why we might want to use the stepwise approach, um, well, there are several reasons. So one of them is efficiency. So you'll notice here that step two doesn't involve the sequence data at all. And calculating the probability of the sequence data can be very time consuming. And so uh, what you can do is, let's say you want to test a whole bunch of different clock models. If you use the joint approach, what you have to do is you have to run an entire joint analysis for every clock model that you want to test. And this will take quite a long time. With the stepwise approach, what you could do instead is you could just run this first step once. So just you know, calculate the probability of the sequence data, get your posterior of branch lane trees, do that step once, and then do your important sampling, and then run step two as many times um, as you have clock models that you actually want to test. And because in step two, you don't have to deal with the sequence data, this step two is much more computationally efficient, and then you can save time not having to run this joint analysis over and over again. Another reason why we might want to use the stepwise approach is flexibility. So you can use different software for each step. So let's say, for example, you have a uh, genetic sequence evolution model that you want to use that's only available in one software package, and you have a clock model that you want to use that's only available in another package. You can't do that under the joint analysis, right? For a joint analysis, you would need all the models that you want to use to exist in the same software package. But with the stepwise approach, you could conceivably use one package to do uh, step one and then another package to do step two. Another reason for using the stepwise approach is extensibility. So you can basically uh, do this breaking up into multiple steps for any hierarchical Bayesian model. So here in this talk, I'm talking about divergence time estimation, but actually um, in the future directions, which I'll talk about a little at the end, um, we're currently applying this approach to uh, inferring species trees, um, species trees from gene trees. And then finally, a really important aspect of the stepwise approach is that it allows you to account for uh, uncertainty explicitly. So it avoids, avoids using only a point estimate 
for each subsequent step of your phylogenetic pipeline. And what I mean by that is if we go back to this first figure, um, often what happens, you know, ideally we would want to be able to estimate everything all at once in a single joint Bayesian analysis because that would be the most accurate thing to do, but that's just not computationally feasible. So generally what we do is we break this analysis up and we we'll say we do our sequence alignment first. And then when we move on to use our sequence alignment to estimate our gene trees, we generally only take a single sequence alignment to infer gene trees with. But what you're doing there is you're basically throwing away all the uncertainty that exists in that sequence alignment. And so if it just so happens that your sequence alignment, the point estimate sequence alignment that you've chosen is not a very good one, that's going to have an effect on all the downstream analyses uh, that you run using that alignment. With the stepwise approach, because you're taking an important sample from the posterior that you got in the previous step, you can explicitly account for all the uncertainty that exists uh, in that posterior um, and you include that uh, uncertainty in your um, following steps. So that's sort of the, the theory and the motivation for why we want to do the stepwise approach. So, uh, you know, the math and the theory you know, works out, but we wanted to, of course, test it explicitly to make sure because you would expect that the joint approach and the stepwise approach um, would give you the same results. So the first thing that we did was sort of build this toy model example, very simple example, um, just to run both approaches and make sure that we do actually get the same posteriors out of both the joint and the stepwise approach. So here in the simple model, we have um, our data points, which are uh, Poisson distributed and the lambda parameter associated with that. Um, we use a log normal prior. And then this log normal prior has two parameters, uh, which are mu and sigma, which are of course the mean and the standard deviation. And then we just set uniform priors on those two uh, parameters. So breaking this joint model up into two steps, in our first step, we have again our data points, which are Poisson distributed. And then we use that data to infer our posteriors for the lambdas. And then in step two, we take an important sample from each of those lambda posteriors that we inferred in step one and use that here as data. And then we use that data to infer uh, the values of mu and sigma, which are our parameters of interest in this case. So, you know, we set up these models and then we performed a bunch of simulations. So we simulated with uh, a different number of observations or data points uh, associated per lambda. So ranging from one to a thousand data points. And then we analyzed this simulated data under both the joint and the stepwise approach. And then what we also did is we tested, um, we varied the number of posterior samples that we're actually taking when we move from step one to step two. So these posteriors of these lambdas, how many um, of these samples do we actually take to use as data when we run step two? So these are our results um, from this toy model. And um, the really important thing here, um, probably the most important point in this talk, is these results illustrate um, the interplay between the amount of information you have in your data and the number of posterior samples that you have to take in order to get a good match between the joint and the stepwise approaches. So what we have here on the top panel is the posterior distributions of this uh, sigma parameter, so the standard deviation of the log normal distribution. And then um, we have in gray the posterior from the joint analysis, and then the blue curves correspond to the posteriors from the stepwise analysis with, um, as the shade of blue gets darker, uh, it corresponds to uh, more and more posterior samples being taken when we move from step one to step two. And then um, as we move from left to right uh, in the columns, we're increasing the number of data points that we have. So we're basically increasing the amount of information that's available in the data. And then in this bottom panel, we're looking at the posterior distribution of uh, just a randomly chosen lambda. Um, again, we have here uh, in gray the joint, and then in blue we have um, the posterior that's inferred by uh, step one of our stepwise approach. So what we see here is if we look at this top left panel here, what we see is when we only have a single data point uh, per lambda, obviously that's not very much information, right? Um, so when we only have a single data point, if we take only one um, posterior sample, if we take only 10 posterior samples, we get a very poor match between the joint and the stepwise analysis. And 
um, as we increase to 100 to 1,000, you know, it gets better. But even with 1,000 um, posterior samples, we're still not getting an exact match between the posterior uh, between the joint and the stepwise approaches. However, if we increase the amount of data, we move to 10 observations, we move to 100, um, we move to 100 observations. What we see is that we get a very good match between the joint and stepwise approaches, even when we only take, say, a single posterior sample. And the reason for this can sort of be seen in um, this bottom panel here. So basically, what we're doing in step two is we're taking samples from this posterior that we get in step one, right, which is shown in this bottom panel. And so when you have very little data, so in this bottom uh, left panel here, the posterior on lambda is going to be very diffuse because there's just not gonna be very much information for you to get a very good estimate of what the value of that parameter should be. But as we increase the amount of data, this posterior, as you can see here, becomes narrower and becomes more peaked because as we add more information, we have more information to actually reconstruct the true value of this parameter. So then we can kind of think about what is actually going on when we take these posterior samples. So here we have um, in blue, this is a, a relatively more diffuse distribution. And then in pink, we have a relatively more narrow and peaked distribution. And let's say the true value of this hypothetical parameter is uh, this red dashed line here. So when we take random samples from both of these distributions, because the probability density of the more diffuse distribution is spread out over a wider range of values, any random sample that we take has a higher probability of being farther away from the true value of the parameter. Whereas if this posterior distribution is very narrow and very peaked, then any random sample we take is going to have a high probability of being very close to the true parameter. So when we have this very diffuse prior and we take only one sample, there's a very good chance that we've picked a sample that is not close to the true value and we end up with a biased result in step two. Whereas when we have a very narrow and peaked um, uh, posterior to draw samples from, even if we take a single sample, that sample was probably very close to the true value and we don't see that same effect. So this is really um, illustrating how, um, you know, the, the amount of information you have in your data sort of determines the shape of the posterior that you're drawing samples from. And then the number of samples that you have to take in order to capture the full amount of uncertainty and variation in that posterior is going to increase the more diffuse that prior is. Basically, the more diffuse prior mathematically has a higher variance. And so you need more samples in order to capture that. And this also really illustrates, I think, why it's so important that we don't only take single point estimates um, when we run these analyses, that we actually do capture um, the uncertainty. Because if you don't, you could potentially bias your uh, downstream analyses. So um, we're, we're convinced from this toy example that, you know, just going back here, um, the conclusion, I guess, is that uh, as long as you do have enough information in your data and you do take enough samples um, relative to that, you do have a perfect match between the joint and the stepwise approaches. So we were convinced by the toy example that, you know, everything was sort of acting the way that it should be based on the theory. So we moved on to the phylogenetic example. So this is a probabilistic graphical model of the full um, divergence time estimation model. This is a joint approach. Um, so some parts of this, you're probably are all familiar with. This is the Q matrix. So here, what I've depicted is GTR, but actually in our paper, we use Jukes Cantor just for computational simplicity. Um, and we're using an uncorrelated log normal relaxed uh, clock model. Um, so one thing I want to point out is you'll see here this distribution called the branch rate tree. So this is something new that we actually had to code up uh, in RefBase. This is all done in RefBase, by the way. Um, this is something new that we had to code up because actually in the traditional way that these um, divergence time models are put together, you have a, a parameter that corresponds to your divergence time tree. So we use a uniform parameter, but you could of course use a birth death. Uh, prior, uh, fossilized birth death prior, whatever prior you'd like. Um, and then you have another um, parameter that uh, is, uh, corresponds to um, drawing your branch rates from some distribution, uh, such as a log normal distribution. And then what you do is you use this um, ultrametric tree and these branch rates that you draw to perform a transformation to get 
your branch lengths because the branch length is equal to rate times time. But what that means is actually in this model, there's no explicit parameter that corresponds to the unrooted branch length tree. And this is a problem because in our stepwise approach, we want to have the output of the first step be a uh, posterior distribution of unrooted branch length trees. So what we did was code up this, this special distribution here so that we could actually put this node, this parameter of the unrooted branch length trees in our model to make it easier to split up into step one and step two. Um, we did a lot of tests to make sure that these approaches are equivalent. Um, then for the details, uh, you can look in uh, our preprint. So here is uh, step one. Um, we have here uh, as input our sequence data, as you see here in the middle, and then our output is a posterior of unrooted branch length trees. Here is step two, where we take an important sample from those distributions of, from that uh, posterior distribution of unrooted branch length trees, and then we get uh, what we want out of it, which is the uh, posterior distribution of rooted ultrametric time trees. So just to kind of make it easier to see, hopefully, how the stepwise approach is explicitly breaking up this joint approach. We have here in the middle, the graphical model for the joint approach. On the top here is step one. Hopefully you can see that the, the right sides of these two are exactly the same. And then here on the bottom is step two, and you can see that the left side of these models are exactly the same. So um, we then you know, did the same thing as with our toy example. We simulated uh, a bunch of data. So we simulated five genetic trees under the birth death process, and we had um, taxa ranging from eight to 16 to 32 taxa. We simulated alignments under the Duke Cantor model with either 100, 1,000, or 10,000 sites. Uh, and then we used the log model, the lax clock model. And then we analyzed these simulated data sets uh, under both our joint approach and our stepwise approach. And then again, we did the same thing like we did with our toy example, where we varied the number of posterior samples that we're taking when we move from step one to step two. So here are our results from our phylogenetic simulations. Um, it basically shows the same thing that we saw uh, in the toy example, right? So we have here, again, on the top, the posterior distribution of the sigma parameter. Um, the colors are the same as before. Um, here on the top panel, we're increasing the amount of data, uh, the amount of information that we have as we move from left to right. And what you see again is when we don't have so much data, uh, when we only take a few posterior samples, we don't get a good match between the joint and the stepwise approaches. But as we increase the amount of information, you know, when we have 10,000 sites, we can take a single sample and we get a good match. Um, here, you might remember from the toy example that um, in our middle amount, of data, we got a good match between joint and stepwise no matter how many samples we take. But obviously that was a very simple model. And here in this very um, much more complex model, we see that taking a single um, posterior sample when you only have a thousand sites is, uh, is not enough. But in general, the patterns are um, the same and what we expect. Um, on the bottom, what we're seeing is the effect of increasing the number of taxa in the analysis. So these are all run with a thousand sites uh, in the data set. And we see that um, as we increase the number of taxa, it seems that we need to increase the number of um, posterior samples that we take in order to get a match between the joint and the stepwise approach. And we think the reason for this is because, you know, since we're keeping the number of sites constant, as we increase the number of taxa, we're increasing the number of branches that are in our tree. And so the ratio of the number of sites we have to the number of branches we have um, decreases as you increase the number of taxa. And so the amount of information that you actually have per branch is decreasing. And we think that's why uh, we have to increase the number of uh, posterior samples to sort of make up for that increased uncertainty. But of course, we're uh, inferring divergence times. And so what we're really interested in is uh, you know, whether the divergence times that we get uh, actually match between the joint and the stepwise approaches. So that's what this plot is. So this plot is showing on the x-axis the ages inferred by the joint analysis. On the y-axis are the ages inferred by the stepwise analysis. And then as we move from left to right, uh, we're increasing the number of sites. As we move from top to bottom, we're increasing the number of taxa. And we see that um, as you increase the amount of information, um, obviously, as you know, mirroring the results we have from looking at our posteriors, uh, we get a very good match between 
uh, the joint and the stepwise um, inferred ages as we, you know, gets better as we increase the amount of data that we have. And as we increase the number of taxa, we also see this pattern where you need more posterior samples to get a good match. It's probably clearest in this bottom right-hand panel here where we see that, um, you know, most of these dots are on the one-to-one -one line, but when we only use one sample, we see that it's very clearly not on the one-to-one -one line as a result of having more taxa in this analysis. So um, uh, in conclusion, um, our results are that um, the joint and the stepwise approaches are indeed uh, identical, but of course there is this caveat, which is that you have to take into account this issue of whether your data are informative enough. And then there's also the um, correlated issue of whether you're taking a sufficient number of important samples in order to um, capture that full uncertainty. And then, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, what we're doing now is we're applying the stepwise approach to the um, gene tree species tree inference under the multi-species coalescence. So um, specifically what we're doing is we're splitting it up again into two steps. And in the first step, we're um, using the sequence uh, data in order to infer posteriors for each of uh, our genes. The nice thing about this is that um, each of those analyses can be independent. Um, so then you can parallelize those analyses and that will save you um, a lot of time um, compared to the joint analysis. And we're hoping will allow you to be able to um, use more genes um, for these species tree gene tree analyses than you would be able to in a joint analysis. And then in the second step, you do the important sampling from those posteriors in order to infer your final species tree. So, um, that's it. So I'd just like to thank uh, the Hana group, the Verheide group, and various people who helped us with discussions, um, and uh, also the GFG Eminota program for supporting me and Sebastian. And as I mentioned, uh, we have a preprint talking about all this. Um, I've skipped over a lot of details. Um, so if you're interested, you can go to this URL and read up on um, all the details that I couldn't get the chance to talk about today. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions.